Hello, good afternoon, the ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and followers. A warm welcome from cold Vienna. Welcome to our 11th hearing roundtable. This time is a very, very special topic about intracochlear and intraoperative measurements. I think a, a very recent and important topic. But now let us for a minute introduce the hearing. The hearing is a very, very special group of experts from, from all over the world. We found 2008 and we are a global network of 31 sensors. So the hearing is setting the standards in the science about cochlear implantation and the related field since 2008. And we are really dedicating experts for cochlear implants. The hearing clinics together cover over 100,000 cochlear implantations. So this is really a big number and, and we are quite proud of this. What, what we are good for is that we, we stand for the innovation, for education, and for collaboration in science. Usually we meet annually. This was not happening during COVID. And because of the COVID, we introduced these hearing round tables. So what we do now is we make also a visualization and a recording of this hearing round table. So please mute your microphones and please name yourself we can have interactive questions, so you can question us if you want to, to have some special answers. Please raise your hand, so it works very, very nice. The meeting is recorded, and later on, it is on YouTube. So beside myself, there's Professor Gavier, Gavier Gavilan from Madrid, University La Paz. Professor Ranjit Raveshwaran from Chennai. Professor Arthur Lorenz from Poland, and Professor Marco Cipulla from the University of Würzburg. Please enjoy the meeting, and we are interested about a very, very nice round table. Additionally, you can have a certificate. The certificate you just need to send us afterwards that you have joined the meeting, and you will have an international accredited certificate for this. And now let's go to Professor Gavilan to Madrid and we will start the, this hearing session. Hello everyone. Hi, Bomi, how are you? Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you all for being there. Uh, welcome to the autumn edition of our Hearing Roundtable series. Uh, Baumi mentioned that this is roundtable number 11. And even though we are recovering in-person activities, the hearing group decided to continue with our quarterly roundtable program. I think this is a way to reach uh, all areas in the world much easier than in-person activities. Even though I prefer uh, very much in-person activities, I still think that this is a very good option. Today, under the, under the exciting title, intraoperative measurements, are they necessary? We want to discuss the usefulness advantages and disadvantages of performing intraoperative electrical measurements during surgery for hearing implants. Not only cochlear implants, but as you will see also ABI and middle ear implants. So over the next 90 minutes, our panelists will share with us their experience on intraoperative measurements during middle ear implants, cochlear implants, both in uh, conventional situations and uh, for EAS, 
and also interoperative measurements for ABI. And like we did with previous roundtables in the hearing group, we want this one to be a really interactive activity. So please, as uh, Bomi mentioned before, feel free to participate, sending us your questions or comments using the chat. You can uh, directly write on the chat or the audio available in your Zoom connection. You ask for permission and we give the word to those that want to ask uh, some questions. And to start with this interaction and show that we really want you to participate, I would like you, I would like to ask you to switch on the camera of your cell phones and you can scan the QR code on the right hand side of your screen or you can go directly through Google to www.menti.com. And either way, you can access our voting, electronic voting, voting system. If you scan your uh, QR code on the right, you will go directly to the Mentimeter where you will have to answer a couple of questions that uh, we want you to tell us about. So, Go there, go to www.menti.com and type 77741494. Or again, you can scan your QR code and enter the Mentimeter. Right now, we are more than 150 participants in this event, and we would like to have as many answers as possible. So let's move to the first question for the Mentimeter. The first, first question is a very simple one, a very easy one that you can all tell us. And it's just a system for you to get used uh, to the use of, of uh, Mentimeter. So can you tell us please, where are you from? Which is your country of origin? Uh, this is just to have an idea uh, about where can we reach uh, with the uh, system of roundtables that we are in the hearing group organizing. So you see we have Austria, Germany, Australia, Brazil, uh, but we only have right now 33 answers. So again, we are more than 150 uh, participants. So please, can you tell us where are you from, which is your country of origin? We see more Dresden, Germany, Germany, United States, uh, KSH, NA, Austria, India, Japan. It's still less than 40 answers. Come on, get your Mentimeter and send us your answers. Okay, we are now over 40 answers. Uh, and this is just to prepare for the next question, which uh, it's uh, more related to the topic of this round table. Uh, remember, we are dealing with intraoperative measurements in hearing implants. Can you tell us if you think these measurements are necessary or not? It's very easy. Yes or no. If you don't think this is useful, maybe from a clinical standpoint or maybe in your uh, own practice, just please tell us that this is not important, this is not necessary uh, from your side. And if you think they are, uh, right now we are, we have 100% of yes, uh, saying yes to our, our question. So if you think, I think we all agree that they are, they are important. We have also in the chat, several answers in, from Egypt uh, and from, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, saying yes, uh, but the answers are now over 50 and we have a clear idea of what uh, is your opinion. So now let, uh, let, let us uh, go on and try to prove that these uh, interoperative measurements are really useful. What we are going to do today is we're going to make a trip with no jet lag, you are going to be 
in Austria, you are going to be in Germany, you are going to be in Poland, right now you're in Madrid and you will be in India. And again, there will be no jet lag. And we will hear a short presentation from each one of the panelists, followed by a discussion. After every presentation, we will have a discussion. For this discussion, you are open to ask any question you want. And we are going to start our journey by traveling to Germany. We are in Würzburg with Professor Mario Cebula, which is the head of experimental audiology and electrophysiology at the University Clinic of Würzburg. And he was appointed associate professor in 2014 and has extensive experience in the field of audiological measurements. He is one of the most uh, valued persons to speak about the topic of our roundtable today. We are delighted to have Professor Sebula among our distinguished speakers. Uh, Mario, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for the introduction to my next topic and for introducing me. Hello, good afternoon in Würzburg. Today, I would like to share my experiences with interoperative measurements in active middle ear implants. The active middle ear implants are a good choice to treat patients with conductive sensory neural or mixed hearing loss. And depending on type of hearing loss and pathology, the acoustic transducer of the system can be coupled to different structures of the middle ear. And thereby the hearing improvement is highly dependent on the coupling efficiency. More than five years ago, we successfully developed an ABR-based method to verify the coupling efficiency of the vibrant sound bridge actuator, that's a floating mass transducer. That's our measurement setup. We are using a standard ABR system. That's the Eclipse from Interacoustics, but you can also use any other standard ABR systems. The transmission of the acoustical stimulus to the power speed is run by the acoustic AP connector. That's a special transmitter device provided by the metal company, the manufacturer of the power speed. For the acoustic stimulation, we are using an optimized broadband chirp stimulus. The stimulation rate is 49.1 stimuli per second. And the recording is done quite traditionally with surface electrodes placed on hairline, mass to eat, and in between the ground electrode. And for one measurement, we averaged about 2,000 single samples uh, for one recording, and that takes about 40 seconds. In this slide, you see an example of the interoperative ABR recorded um, with uh, via the acoustic AP adapter. And the post is the patient had a preoperative bone conduction threshold between 25 to 40 dB. HL and air conduction between 60 and 65 dB HL. And short head coupler was used to couple the FMT to the ossicle change. The initial stimulus uh, um, level um, based on the preoperative pre pre bone conduction PTS3 threshold, that means the average from one, two, and four kilohertz thresholds. And then we add 20 dB to be over threshold at the beginning. In this case, we have a preoperative PC PTE3 threshold of about 30 dB. So we add 20 dB and start with 50 dB each hour. The upper curve shows you the average AVR response. And you can see uh, the most prominent wave five uh, very clearly. And we could either identify the wave five down to 35 dB each hour. The wave five is here marked with a little arrow. And so we estimate the um, ABR threshold between 35 dB and 30 dB HL. That's a very close to the preoperative wound conduction PTS3 threshold, which was 31.5 dB HL. So we can assume a good coupling of the FMT. 
And this figure shows you the good matching of the preoperative boom conduction swerfle and the intraoperative ABS swerfle. So the regression analysis, which was done here with 65 patients implanted with a power B using different couplers, shows a really high correlation. The correlation coefficient is here 0 0.85, and the corresponding L square is 0 0.7. So we can conclude that the intraoperative ABR can be reliably measured. The results are very helpful to support the implantation process in difficult situations, for example, to place the FMT the around window. And we have first information about the expected aid adherence vessel, which can be used later for the first fitting. And furthermore, the method can also be extended to receive frequency-specific information. Yes, um, thank you for the, uh, following my short presentation. Thank you very much. Mario, now let's uh, move to the discussion. We remember we, we are going to discuss the usefulness of intraoperative electrical measurements in middle ear implants. And I remember when I started uh, using a vibrant sound bridge uh, some years ago, we were doing uh, intraoperative uh, recording with ECAP. You're using ABR. Uh, what's the difference? What are the advantages? Uh, what should, which one should we use today? Um, the advantage of the ECAP is that you can receive clearly higher amplitudes and a maybe sh shorter measurement time. But the problem is that the, the, the positioning of the, of the electrode for the ECAP measurements are very close to the inner ear. It's um, a step more for the surgeon. And for me, it is more complicated than doing a standard ABR measurement. A standard ABR measurement is the electrode before, before the implantation begins. And then in, in a few seconds, we can, can repeat and repeat our measurement and we have not to take care of the electrode which is placed um, in the round window niche or whatever to uh, record the e uh, Good. A Concerning the, the electrical uh, measurements intraoperatively, when, when, when I was using, when I'm, I'm using a vibrant sound bridge, middle ear implant into the wrong window, I think this is a crucial uh, tool. I mean, I don't feel myself comfortable doing an, a, a vibrant sound bridge without the feedback from the electrophysiologist. Uh, and I want to ask Baumi, which is the other surgeon in the group. Uh, do you have the same feeling or you do the sound bridge and just put it in the wrong window and feel safe without knowing what's coming back from that? No, yes, I, I wanted uh, to ask Mario already because we started the sound bridge very early. I did my first sound bridge in 1998. So that's quite some time ago. And then in the year 2000, this was already still under the old company, Symphonics company. We had then from Mark Winter first uh, reverse transfer function for surgeries we had on the long process on the ECOS, which was useful. Honestly, it was useful because we all first started many years until the year 2005. We should not forget that from 96 to 2005 until until Vittorio Coletti, uh, for nine years, we used the sound bridge only on the long process on the inkles. And it was difficult enough to prove a, a nice coupling on this particular well structured region. And we were extremely happy about the reverse transfer function, but the reverse transfer function was dependent on a well working ossicular chain and on a well working tympanic membrane. Then in the year 2005, when we started with round window, oval window, fenestration, and all other types of surgeries, later on in 2011, we started even with the couplers. And in 2014, we even started with the new couplers, the couplers we have now, they are from 2014. We had very, very difficult pathologies and this old reverse transfer function did not work at all anymore because it has another physical background. And I'm extremely helpful for this. And the round window surgery for me is really 
difficult, not so much in the handling, but always I have a very bad feeling because I cannot prove intraoperatively what we're doing. And I'm extremely thankful to Professor Zipula and the Würzburg team that they developed this. It, I think it's a, it's a big step, a mandatory step, uh, a really most important step. And I hope this will become a, a medical product very soon, which can be delivered to, to all the departments doing something. Ranjit, how do you do that? You do the same, you do not do, you tell us your opinion. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we don't have much experience with the, the SPs, but uh, we have some experience with other middle implants. But I have uh, one um, uh, comment or a question to, to Mario here. Uh, Mario, it's fantastic to use the standard ABR, which is much more user friendly than the other ECAP measures. But my question is like, you know, when you measure an, EA, an, an ABR, and um, there are certain parameters that play an effect on it. For example, the, the kind of stimuli what you give, you can give a, a high frequency stimuli or a low frequency stimuli, a click stimuli or a tone burst, you know. Yes. Do you see any effect of this varying stimulation parameters when you do interoperative measures in your recordings? Yeah, actually, we are using a um, broadband short stimulus, but um, we have also uh, started with a frequency specific measurement. Um, that's a kind of ASSR measurement. So we have uh, information from uh, one kilohertz to and four kilohertz. And um, that would be our, our goal at, at the end that we have like an um, estimated audiogram from the, uh, during the, the, the implantation process so that we can immediately start the, the fitting process based on this measurement. But actually we are standard using a broadband stimulus. Okay, uh, one more. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Randy, go ahead. Sorry, 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 Gabia. Gabia, I mean, I remember I was using, in an initial days we are using, we use this LDVs. Uh, I, I'm sure you must be aware of this, uh, laser Doppler vibrometers, uh, 0.5 millimeter aperture to measure the, you know, movement of the stapes when you give a middle ear implant. Do you see any application of the VSBs with these um, uh, modern devices that's available just to see the input output function of the device? We don't 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 use the laser. Uh, only in, in our lab, and before we started okay. with our measurement, we verified our method uh, in the in the, with the LD view uh, measurement, but not not uh, interoperative. Mario, I have one question from the audience uh, that I must recognize. I don't understand. I hope you do. Uh, Professor Cebula, can you please justify the marking of wave five? in the tracings you presented latency-wise? Yeah. Um, the background is that we have um, adjusted the, the, the stimulus time and all the delays which the, um, the power speed delivers so that we have in a normal hearing <coughs> it's, um, exactly that what we know from the standard ABR measurement. So that we have we are very close to the hearing threshold and we have the latency between seven and eight milliseconds and so on. Okay, we have a question from the big boss in Bisburg, my okay. good friend, <laughs> Professor Hagen, Rudolf, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I like the system, of course, very much, um, but it was a special situation, live surgical course, revision surgery, and there was no visibility of the foot plate. And it was planned to insert uh, the oval window coupler. And I depended completely on haptic response. So with this system, I was at the end of surgery completely safe that my feelings only touching with this coupler is okay. And this is maybe one of the best things uh, in a really <clears throat> difficult surgery. But my question to Mario Tribula is, did we ever had technical problems by disturbing signals from the surrounding uh, things in OR by anesthesiologists or something else? Is it is it difficult? At the beginning, we had problem particularly with this power hundred, but you know, in the operational room, we have many uh, devices working there. But uh, we have adjusted our uh, stimuli paradigm 
uh, so that we have a relatively high um, repetition rate that is 49.1 stimuli per second. So within a um, uh, few minutes, the, the, the disturbance will disappear in the average response. That is one, one um, uh, problem formally. The other is that we have um, observed that the sleep monitoring from anesthesia can be a problem because there is a repeated uh, impedance checking of the system. So we removed the connection from this monitor during our measurements. And that's all. So actually, we have uh, not re really problems which are would be disturb our measurement. Okay, uh, I have I have one one more question. Yes, Bami, wait a second. I have one more question. We're dealing with with round window and with round window. It's obvious that we need some background, some 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 uh, feedback. I mean, some 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 information from you. But is this the same with a short process of the increase coupler? I mean, you have. The, the thing goes where it has to go and we cannot change. Uh, the interoperative measurements are as needed there as they are for round window? For the round window, I think it is very important uh, because you don't know where is the, the optimal placement. And uh, we have um, observed that it is uh, very important so that the was <coughs> able to, to shift or find the right position um, for the round window coupler, and for the so that uh, and we can immediately repeat the measurement within only one minute, because one measurement takes um, forty seconds. Once if you have found the threshold, then based on that we can immediately repeat one measurement after another, uh, so that we have a good feedback with the surgeon to find the optimal position. Okay, I have one question from the audience, which is the one you answered right now. What is the interoperative test duration of vibrant sound bridge? You mentioned 40 seconds every measurement. So uh, uh, you repeat as many times as you want, right? At the beginning, we, we try to find the hearing vessel. So it takes only two or three me measurements. That's about two, between two and three minutes. If everything is fine, normally if you have a short process cut and so then it's normally enough. But uh, if you have the, the uh, more complicated um, a placement like out window, over a window, what Professor uh, Hagen already mentioned, then we repeat the measurement until we have a good response. And uh, okay. it takes only one minute. Last, get, uh, last question. Uh, Baumi, you wanted to say something? Yes, actually, I think it's an important statement, maybe. You must not trust laser Doppler clinically in surgery because it has another physical principle. Laser Doppler measurement and laser Doppler vibrometry is very nice, especially in the temporal bone specimen. And it is quite some work and time consuming in the real surgical setup. We did this uh, a few times, and you need to be aware that the measurement from Professor Sipula with the auditory response, so with the bearer, is not necessarily corresponding at all with your laser Doppler result because your laser Doppler result gives you just a pure physical signal uh, of the transmission in the fluid properties, which is completely different to the signal which is done through the cochlea and the brain. Yes. So to get a good result for the patient, Professor Sibula's work is much, much superior and much better for the real life in patient than any laser Doppler. Okay, thank you very much. We will have time, more time to discuss about middle ear implants after all the presentations. But right now we have to move to the next presentation and uh, keeping, on, keeping on with our journey, we are now going to India. We're now in Chennai, India, to meet Professor Ranjit Rajaswaran. Ranjit is a good friend and the director and chief audiologist at the MERF Institute of Speech and Hearing of Madras ENT Research Foundation. He has co-developed this center as one of the most sophisticated with state-of-the-art infrastructure and latest, latest cutting-edge technology to provide the best 
for the patients. His special focus is on hearing restoration and hearing implants, and we are really proud of the hearing group to have him among our distinguished members. Ranjit is going to deal with uh, intraoperative measurements in ABI. Ranjit, you have your five minutes and then we will have the discussion. All right, well, thank you very much. Very good evening to everyone. And thanks for the nice introduction. So I'm gonna give my perspective on intraoperative measures in auditory brainstem implant. So as you all know, auditory brainstem implant is a, a, a solution for children and adults who do not qualify for cochlear implant due to anomaly of the cochlea, anomaly of the nerve or the um, uh, tumor in the, uh, in the auditory nerve. Yeah, so one of the uh, major challenge in the auditory brain stem implant is the uh, surgical approach to the cochlear nucleus. Can you move to the next slide? And also to the uh, positioning of the electrode on the cochlear nucleus. As you all know, cochlear nucleus is one of the most sophisticated uh, uh, structure, not only in terms of function, but also in terms of anatomical access during the surgery. Next slide, please. Now, apart from that uh, difficulty in access to it, it also has other complexities where it's very close proximity to the other cranial nerves, like you know, 5, 9, 10, 11, and 12, which are just few millimeters away from the cochlear nucleus. So the most important challenge is to position this electrode exactly on the cochlear nucleus. The next slide, please. Um, so that the, uh, 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 the perception of the sound quality is much better. So if you don't position it on the cochlear nucleus, there may be some electrodes which will be outside the cochlear nucleus, which means they will be stimulating the non-auditory nerves, causing uh, discomfort to the patient and also causing a lot of um, irritation in terms of the sound quality. So the, the paramount of the success of the cochlear brainstem implant is the optimal positioning of the electrode on the cochlear nucleus. Next slide, please. Now, how do we do it? So intraoperatively, it is quite challenging uh, uh, to do it. The one um, uh, tool that we have to, um, which gives information about uh, the position of the electrode on the cochlear nucleus, which in turn gives feedback for the surgeon to position and reposition the, uh, uh, the electrode would be electrically evoked auditory brainstem response. As we all know, uh, next slide please, the electrically evoked auditory brainstem response is very similar to acoustic ABR. The only difference is the stimuli is electrical. Um, um, in, in the conventional ABR, the, the stimuli is acoustic. Um, the morphology of the electric ABR and the acoustic ABR may vary. Next slide, please. Uh, depending on the, the site of stimulation. For example, if you're giving electrical stimulus on the cochlea using cochlear implant, you might have the uh, four peak, four auditory peak morphology. Whereas when you stimulate on the cochlear nucleus, you might have the three auditory peak morphology, theoretically. Next slide, please. Now, um, the, the amplitude growth function and the reproducibility is a hallmark of acoustic ABR, and it stands good even for the electric ABR. So which means any recording which has got an amplitude growth and reproducibility is only considered as the true physiological response. Restore is not considered as a physiological response. Next slide, please. So um, in our cohort of uh, 75 patients with auditory brain stem implant, we recorded um, in this study, we looked at uh, uh, um, 48 subjects where we recorded uh, 405 electrodes out of 576 electrodes. Um, and we classified the morphologies based on the presence and the number of replicable positive peaks observed in the recording. Next slide, please. So based on our uh, classification, we classified the next one, please. Next. So based on this our recording, we have classified the morphology into five types based on the presence of the peak and the latency of the peak. We have uh, EABR with single peak early latency, EABR with single peak late latency. We have classified, uh, we have found uh, uh, recordings with two peak EABRs, three peak EABRs, and uh, four peak EABRs. Next slide, please. So um, the latency of the peaks vary from 0.6 milliseconds to 6.52 milliseconds of the site of stimulation, which means whether you stimulate the medial electrode or the lateral inferior electrode, the latency does not go below 0.6 or above 6.52. No 
Now, we again looked at the uh, classification of the, uh, 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 the peaks uh, based on the latencies, and we correlated the, um, uh, the peaks with respect to the auditory and non-auditory subjective responses. Next slide. So in this correlation, we found that uh, uh, there are a few patients in which the uh, subjective non-auditory responses correlated very well with the later peaks, that is peaks, next slide please, the peaks after 3.72 milliseconds. So any peak less than 3.72 milliseconds did not have much of non-auditory responses, but peaks after 3.72 milliseconds had more of non-auditory behavioral responses, which also correlated with some subjects who can behaviorally give uh, 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 subjective uh, responses for auditory versus non-auditory. Next slide, please. So, so based on this, we again reclassified our morphologies as auditory uh, um, uh, responses and non-auditory response morphologies and mixed responses, where you will have both auditory peaks and also non-auditory peaks, which means this electrode is stimulating both the cochlear nucleus and also some other cranial nerves, which is adjacent to the cochlear nucleus. Next slide, please. So, and then we simplified our classification. So based on the latency of the response, we classified the latencies between 0.6 to 3.04 as auditory zone and point. 3.72 to 6.77 as non-auditory zone, which means any peak which falls within the zone is either auditory or non-auditory. Uh, and there is a, 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 a zone of uncertainty, which is 0.3.04 to 3.72. Now, this is debatable because this depends on the latency uh, of the responses, which also correlates with the stimulation level and the etiology. Next slide. So looking at the... Um, um, uh, relationship between the EABR and the outcomes and all the subjects in whom there are more than 75% of the electrodes elicited auditory ABR responses had much better speech and language performance scores. Next one. So the, the, the future is next one, please. We tried using ECAP in, in ABI and it's a very preliminary investigation that we're working out and we could uh, get some reliable responses with, with, with uh, different parameter effects, effects of pulse duration, next slide. And we also looked at the responses with respect to different recording electrode sites. So now we are working on it and later the, we will develop an algorithm which will also uh, help us to position the electrodes based on the ECAP measurements, which will also complement the EABR uh, measurements as well. Next one. So the Final um, uh, take home message from this uh, presentation is EABR is a reliable tool and amplitude growth function and the reproducibility is still the hallmark of good responses. And the patients in whom you can elicit uh, more uh, auditory uh, uh, EABRs uh, shows much better outcomes. And all the peaks, which is um, 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 longer than four milliseconds are, have to be correlated with non-auditory responses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjit. I have a, a surgical question. I know you're an electrophysiologist, but uh, I, I have a, a problem with ABIs. Uh, we all agree that you need to find the place. It's not like in a, a, a CI. Yeah. CI, you put the electrode and it goes to its place. Okay. Why do we have to use a test electrode before the final electrode when we do an ABI? Because once I put the test electrode and I find the right position, when I remove the test electrode and I insert the final electrode, I'm starting from scratch. It's like zero. I, I don't. I cannot put it in the same position as the, as the previous one. So, uh, what's the reason for that? I mean, I was expecting somebody would ask this question. Thanks for bringing that. <laughs> okay. The thing is, um, see, we have two groups of patients. One is pediatric and adults. The adults are mostly uh, neurofibromatous type two, the tumor patients, where the tumor is resected and you'll have to put an electrode. In all pediatric cases, we do not use test electrodes for measuring responses, but we use test electrodes just to check the depth of insertion, how much they can push to create more space or less space, just for the, um, uh, the depth and the spacing out, we use those electrodes. But for patients with NF2, we use test electrodes. The reason is the NF2 patients do not perform as good as pediatrics, right? And in our own experience, you know, we have a policy 
if we do not get a response in test electrode and we abort the surgery for NF2, we, don't, we won't proceed with the, uh, uh, the surgery. But in pediatric cases, you're absolutely right. The more you take in and out, in and out, you're also causing more trauma to the site, more trauma to the uh, tissue. And once you remove it, and again, being back in the position is easy because every movement is millimeters or micromillimeters. Every micromillimeter movement makes a lot of difference in responses. So we, as a policy, we do not use a test electrode for the right placement in pediatric group. Whereas we use the test electrode for decision-making in NF2 patients. Well, I'm very, very happy to hear your answer. And right now I know that they won't kill me because I don't use it in pediatric patients. So I totally agree with you. Uh, Rudolf Hagen, please, can you tell us your question? So the case is pediatric case of uh, nerve aplasia, isn't it? So, Say yeah, it again. So the pediatric case of uh, cochlear nerve aplasia, isn't it? Uh, the pediatric is cochlear nerve aplasia. Yes. Um, aplasia. Yep. And, and, and in neurofibromatosis, it's sometimes really a hard work. Can you give uh, a custom impression how long it, it lasts uh, until you get an, is it 15 minutes? Is it 14 seconds like Mario Cibula made two, two, two hours? What, what's what's uh, your... It's, it's not in minutes, it's in hours. I yes. would say an average on an average of 90 minutes to 150 minutes. So it goes uh, such a long procedure because you have to check electrode by electrode. The, 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 based on our study and also from the re uh, literature references, you need to get responses at least in 75% of the electrodes, which means out of 12 electrodes, you need to get good responses in nine electrodes for good auditory performance. So all patients who had more than nine electrode uh, auditory responses have performed very well compared to the other subjects. So it is very crucial, but where we need to test electrode by electrode. And as you know exactly, um, there are too many noises uh, uh, which can interplay with your recording and especially if it's electrical too. And when you're working in OR, so canceling the noise and pulling out the true uh, physiological response, everything takes a little longer time. You have to go one step at a time. So um, that's how we do it. But what we have done is considerably, we have reduced the duration of testing because we, we developed a, a strategy of uh, measuring the uh, EAVR. So what we do is, in the first instance, I will not measure electrode by electrode. I stimulate all electrodes together. That's the beauty of this metal implant. Now, you don't have to stimulate electrode by electrode. I can stimulate all electrodes together, which means it's stimulating the entire area of the cochlear nucleus, whether it is on the cochlear nucleus or a little off the cochlear nucleus. So the charge is much larger. So definitely you will get a good response. So this response, what I get by measuring all, by stimulating all electrodes, forms a template for me to identify the peaks when I stimulate you know, individual electrodes. So just by doing that, 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 gives, that gives me a fantastic template for me to you know, identify the responses much faster. So it sounds like hard work, but I think it's a real good example for a perfect interview in the river. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Arthur Lawrence, uh, you want to ask something? I'd like to congratulate uh, Ranjit. Uh, I uh, understand that, uh, of course, intraoperative measurements are for surgeon to help to perform the surgery. But uh, I learned from Ranjit that also for, for the audiologists who are doing the fitting. From my clinical perspective, because we have also mm -hmm. here in uh, Cayetan in Poland experience with ABI in children, uh, the biggest problem is to decide uh, what is the type of reaction in a small, no cooperative uh, child. So uh, uh, if I see that the child is uh, uh, doing some sort of a behavioral response, uh, uh, always in my mind is the question, it is really hearing or maybe feeling because a small child is not able to tell you what is the uh, actually uh, type of the response. Uh, we are very happy to see any uh, reaction from the child. So uh, always this is a very 
very uh, big uh, clinical uh, dilemma, big problem uh, to keep the electrodes or to switch uh, the electrode uh, off. And with the um, um, side effects, uh, non-visible side effects, but uh, sort of a feeling response, it is always better to switch this electrode uh, off, not to lose uh, actually information. So uh, I, I really love this work because we can use that uh, in our feeding. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one last question, short question, Ranji. Uh, children, uh, you don't use uh, the test electrode, as you said before, and you don't get a good answer, uh, a good response from your uh, final electrode. What do you do? That's a very interesting question. So now, it depends. A couple of things. So decision making um, also involves the parents' decision as well because we take a consent from them. We have two groups of patients. One group of patient is uh, self-funded patients. Another group of patients through the uh, system. So the patients who are funded through this, if we don't get good responses, it doesn't matter. We we stick on to it and then we go ahead. But for a patient who's self, just with the family. And if the family says it doesn't matter, we can go ahead with it, then we go ahead. Because the reason is, the reason is some of the responses that you don't get it intraoperatively, we have got it postoperatively. Right? But intraoperative poses a lot of challenges because the position of the, uh, uh, the, the electrode on the, uh, the contact point of the electrode on the surface of the cochlear nucleus matters a lot. And after a few minutes, what happens is there's so much of uh, CS of secretion comes, there's a uh, and a fluid between the electrode surface and the and the tissue surface. So all these things also contribute for a poor responses. And also looking at the anatomy of the uh, uh, of the brain stem. So now you also have some patients with uh, anomalous brain stem anatomy. You know, and most often microanatomical differences are very difficult to predict using your uh, uh, radiological imaging. We, we got quite a few of patients whom we had surprises when we opened up, you know, which was not very much visible in the radiological thing. So basically the decision making whether to abort the surgery or go ahead with the surgery depends on the parents' concerns as well. But given a choice, if, if cost is not a major factor in this, I would prefer to put the device there and then, and then uh, use it. Okay. Thank you very much, Ranjit. We are keeping with our trip. We are coming from India and going to Austria, to Vienna. And here in Vienna, we have Wolf-Dieter Baumgartner. Professor Baumgartner is the professor of otorhinolaryngology at the Medical School of Vienna, and he's the head of the ENT department and senior physician at the Vienna ENT University Hospital. He was elected as new president of the Corlas in 2020. And furthermore, Professor Baumgartner is the current chairman of the hearing group since 2017. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Baumgartner, who is going to deal with uh, the intraoperative measurements in electroacoustic stimulation. Baumi. Thank you very much for this very, very nice introduction. It's wonderful. Yes, so electric acoustic stimulation is not an invention from us. It was an invention from Christoph from Ilberg in Frankfurt, 1999, where you have cochlear implantation in residual hearing. And since many, many years, we try to find out hey, how we can measure, measure objectively this residual hearing. Actually, all the, the implants uh, have abilities to stimulate and to measure. So we have in the Synchrony 2 cochlear implant with a wonderful measurement of stimulation and we can measure actually permanently during the insertion, during the surgery, the imminent damage of the implant. So this is nothing very, very special. Oh, it doesn't work. I'm sorry, slides doesn't go forward. Yes. So what we do, what we want to do, we want to measure during our surgery in residual hearing patients, 
we want to measure how many cells survive or are still in function actually to prove that we do not damage the cells during the insertion. And this is what we work quite some time on. And if we look at the cells, we see we can record cochlear action potentials, summation potentials from the inner hair cells, and the cochlear microphonics. So these are the three types of signals we can measure in a cochlear implantation. And this measurement is coordinated electrically and acoustically via the cochlear implant. So what, what we do, so we make an acoustic input in the residual hearing patient. So an acoustic input like in a more or less conventional bearer, but the result we measure electrically via the coch already implanted cochlear implant electrode. So this is, this is what we do. So it's a CE mark tool and it's allowed for, for clinical use already. And now I need to say something very special because pre pre preparing this presentation, I thought who had first the idea? Because for many years I thought we in Vienna had the idea already in the 2000s, that's wrong. So to be honest, the Varsha group had the idea. There was, I don't remember, 2000 or 2001, 2002, a workshop in Varsha. And in this workshop, we had this idea 20 years ago. And then um, I worked together with Oliver Adunker, uh, whom I sent later on to Wolfgang Stöttner to Frankfurt to, to improve our model from Vienna. And then, then Oliver Adunker moved to Chapel Hill. And then all our work was from the University UNC somehow sold to another cochlear implant manufacturer, which was very, very sad because this was all our work started in Vienna, then Frankfurt, and at the end, somebody else got all the benefit from our work. And you see, this was already published in 2005. But what I can tell you, in the meantime, we are much better. So what you see are here, the different types of signals. So you can have in the cochlea, you can measure, as I said before, the microphonics, all the stuff. And here are some results what we measured, but in the sake of time, I want to show you the surgical video. So this is what, what we can show. This is our, our system now, what we use in Vienna for the surgery. So you see on the left-hand side, you see the acoustic part, you see the computer, on the right hand side, you see the dip, and you see also for additional stimulation, electric stimulation of the implant. You use the, the standard software and the recording for each channel, the recording for each channel takes up to 15 seconds. So now that doesn't sound much, but on the other hand, you should not forget, often we measure up to 12 channels. So 12 times 15 is then a few minutes. And we measure every two millimeters. So altogether, to be honest, the measurement can last about 30 minutes. But that also means that the insertion process in electric acoustic stimulation can last 30 minutes. And this is much, much longer, and in my opinion, much more traumatic than any nowadays so-called computerized robotic system can achieve because the nowadays robotic system insert five minutes. We insert 30 minutes. Yeah, this is a very big difference. And the recording starts during the electrode insertion. And then when we're finally in, so we make the idea. So you see here, you see here the flex electrode. And as we all know, you can measure and stimulate at any, at any electrode from the flex electrode. So we have now about 200 iterations and we, the measurement window is five milliseconds. The delay is two milliseconds and the system is extremely stable. So we did it now in over 30 patients and we had actually nearly no artifacts. So it's extremely, extremely stable, even in the OR. So here you see some, some spikes from the, from the insertion here again later on, but I want to show you this. So this is a recording from different insertion depth recorded from different electrodes. If you see the, 
the black side here, this is actually not an answer. So this is not a response, but the red, the red one and the green one are considered to be responses uh, from, the, from the organ of Corti. And here I show you now the video. It's a 90 second video. Here you see there is no response. So this is nothing. That means we have no response from the brain. But now the insertion is very shallow. So we go, the video is cut, so it's not the, the original speed. So now we go for the next, and you see already here, we have two lines, the black line and the red line. There is not the real recording, but here, slowly, a recording does appear. So we measure permanently, so we have the insertion. We have two modes. You can measure permanently, which is a little bit more difficult, what I like and which is more feasible and more solid and stable in the results if you insert for a for specific millimeter, then make the measurement, you insert again, make the measurement. And here you see already in other colors, you see the different millimeters of insertion with different electrodes. You see that you have a result. You have an electric result from an acoustic stimulation. So you must not forget, this is an acoustic stimulation of 500 Hertz or 250 Hertz. We select the acoustic stimulation in the range where the patient still has residual hearing. So this is acoustic stimulation and we make the electric measurement via the cochlear implant. And, and so we can prove that, that we have the, the organ of Corti and the cochlear microphonics we have preserved. So you see, here we have quite some interesting answers and we have now experience of over 30, so 30 EAS patients. So already, already the very first uh, study was already published with a similar system from Gunesh Rajan many years ago. Also the Hanover group at the moment is working with a similar system like we do. And of course, we in Vienna work as well. But I think at the moment we are quite successful. We are ready to publish the data soon. We have the ECOX with 250 and 500 Hertz acoustically. And what we sometimes see is the different stimulation levels, but altogether it works very, very nice. And I definitely believe that this is the future of cochlear implantation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baumi. We still have some minutes for discussion. Uh, I, I want to start the, the discussion with a question to you. Uh, with the experience I have on uh, auditory monitoring during acoustic tumor removal, yeah. we learned that when the signal goes down, mm -hmm. it's yes. too late. Yes. You are receiving information yeah. from something you did time ago. Do we have the same situation with this recording with the with the electrode? Or I mean, we can we do something? Yeah. Or they are just telling us you've done it, finish. We have discussed this extensively, and I'm still not sure how to answer, but it seems to me, so I, I need to tell you, and it's unbelievable. In actually, what I remember in all the classic EIS cases, we could preserve the hearing. But we had some borderline EIS cases, so patients who were not really EIS cases, and we, we did because we want to test the system and we want to gain experience, and we did it, and we lost the hearing. And I think, to be honest, it behaves like in acoustic neuroma, as you said, when you lose the result, then it's too late. So actually, it's just a justification what you have already preserved. But once you are done, you are done. So if you have your accident intracochlearly, then you had it. Yes, it's like this. I think. Okay, so. Professor Hagen. Interesting um, lecture. Uh, my question: If you get the information during surgery that your hearing goes down, then you have the possibility to stop. Yes. Try absolutely. It, yeah. Try absolutely. it again, but the uh, hearing is, is gone. Will you continue with the insertion and say, okay, then I do a complete insertion, or what, what's your yeah, procedure? Yeah. Professor, thank you very much. It's absolutely, as you say, so we had some 
to, I remember two cases from very borderline EIS cases uh, where, where we stopped. Yes, that's true. Uh, I, I just thought it, it was really delicate because the question I was thinking interoperatively to change to another electrode, to be honest. Yes, but, of course. but then I thought to go out and in again is even more trouble. So we kept it. And, and in those cases, <laughs> you are right, where we lost it, finally, then I said, okay, we lost it, so we make full insertion, because we lost it anyway. But you're absolutely right. What I don't know how to surpass this. What we need is a little bit an alarm beforehand. But I have not, I have not seen this. Yeah. I mean, we have just 30 cases, and I think at the moment we learn to learn to live with the system. What I would like to have is now a little bit uh, uh, more products in different departments that we all together, also with the with the with the engineers, with the neuroaudiologists, I would call them because I think it's a special subspeciality, a neuroaudiologist actually, uh, to learn with them if we have some parameters let's say a few seconds before as a kind of alarm. At the moment, we do not have this. But on the other hand, this surgery is extremely satisfying for the, per for the surgeon once it's working, because at the end of your surgery, you really know that you have not done damage. And we mm -hmm. even see it on the next day on the post of Puritanodigram. So, so for you as a surgeon, it's also very, very satisfying. It's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice experience. And also it helps the patient. Okay, uh, Professor Stubula. Yes, um, well, yeah, that was a very uh, nice presentation. Uh, what I uh, wanted to know, what kind of acoustical stimuli you are using for the 5002? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I hope I'm not wrong uh, <laughs> because our engineer is not around, but it's, uh, it's similar to notch noise bearer. So it's 500 hertz. It's, it's narrow band. It's a narrow band stimulus. Exactly. Yeah, it's this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ranjit. Yeah, Bomi, thank you so much. That's a very, very interesting presentation. I, I know that's the future. That's what everybody is eyeing on to it. But I have a, a very uh, peculiar question uh, to you uh, because you have more experience than, than us in this field. Now, we also have a certain category of patients with a pathology called auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, yes. where, where the residual hearing is not gone completely, right? But they don't perform very well with the hearing aid nor with an FM device. So the final option is they have to go for an implant. But the biggest yeah. question is, can we predict outcomes in them? We, have, few... not, yeah, we have not operated such a patient okay. right now. Yeah, I know exactly, yeah, because of the auditory neuropathy. So okay. those, those, yeah, those are those are patients where the outer hair cells are, have full function, and right. the hearing nerve does not work, and they have no speech understanding and a very poor outcome. Those patients we have not implanted. So far. I'm not sure. I think because our system re, uh, relies on the hearing nerve, and so I think if you have an auditory neuropathy, this particular system is maybe not the right system. But we will see. Okay. Okay, Arthur, what's your opinion about all this discussion? Uh, I hope to actually have the, also the possibility to co uh, to uh, complement uh, and to uh, give a, a little bit uh, uh, also our perspective from uh, what was uh, actually presented. Uh, we. Uh, uh, in my presentation, uh, I will try to focus on this uh, two aspect. Uh, Baumi actually identified this alarm uh, possibilities, uh, and uh, these uh, also uh, uh, cases uh, with borderline um, um, classification or even not. Uh, residual hearing in a uh, quite, uh, let's say, a small amount that uh, it is not EAS, but uh, uh, I think that uh, this type of measurements, uh, especially the microphonic, which we can measure, can actually uh, be used uh, for uh, for this, um, not only to confirm that uh, we preserve hearing, but also uh, as a, a tool for surgeon, uh, first of all, 
as this uh, alarm, so uh, not to push more, for example, uh, and also uh, as a tool to uh, uh, to assess uh, even not hearing uh, preservation, but structure preservation, because uh, as uh, I would like also to present, uh, as it was also present uh, already, it is possible to register this microphonics, even if a very small uh, residual hearing. Okay, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience, but we will let them for the next block, because right now it's time to continue our journey and move to Poland, to Warsaw. And we are in Warsaw to meet uh, Arthur Lawrence. Arthur Lawrence is the professor and head of the Department of Auditory Implant and Perception of the World Hearing Center at the Institute of Physiology and Pathology of Hearing in Warsaw. He has received the first award from the Minister of Health and Social Welfare for outstanding achievements in healthcare. The hearing group is glad to have Professor Lawrence is one of our active members, and he is going to deal now with intraoperative measurements in cochlear implants. Arthur? Yes, thank you for uh, your kind uh, introduction. Uh, as I uh, already mentioned, I would like uh, to continue the uh, this uh, subject of uh, using uh, uh, possibility to uh, do the intra-op measurements, um, to measure the multi-frequency uh, response um, uh, for, uh, for the acoustic stimuli to assess the cochlear function, because uh, the structure preservation is uh, now the standard, even if we don't have in mind that we want to uh, actually use EAS afterwards. Uh, it is non-functional residual hearing. We would like to see if we can preserve the structure uh, of cochlea, because in this way, we, uh, we are sure that uh, the op that we increase the information uh, delivery to the ner nerves, to the uh, neural elements, because they uh, uh, could be preserved in a better way, so they can respond better to even electric stimulation uh, alone. And uh, 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 the uh, the work which was done uh, in um, Vienna inspired us uh, to actually research on this uh, topic uh, of the cochlear microphonics uh, registered through the uh, electrodes of the implant, uh, and we. Uh, Publish uh, one paper on uh, on this recording post operatively when we actually looked to the different parameters of the uh, signal and also to the different uh, levels of threshold that we can uh, be actually uh, able to uh, measure the uh, uh, microphonics. So you you can uh, see here uh, the example of the uh, post op audiogram in the left side. It was uh, implanted. It, uh, with the hearing preservation, but uh, the amount of the residual hearing is very small, but still we were able to register the response for 250 tone and also for 500 uh, tone. So uh, this method could be, uh, of course, applied also intraoperatively. Uh, so this is the same setup uh, what was, was uh, presented by in the uh, uh, presentation uh, from the Vienna, uh, and we uh, are using uh, the um, res res research so software uh, Maestro, uh, which uh, is the uh, with the possibility of acoustic stimulation through the acoustic part, which is called the Datman, and this is acoustic stimulation. So uh, the stimulation is through the uh, insert phones, and we can put this insert form before surgery. Uh, we don't need to use this uh, electric stimulation part in, during the surgery. Uh, however, we can uh, measure uh, another properties like telemetry to be sure that the implant is actually performing.
performing uh, well. What I'd like to actually uh, draw your attention is to the novel SPL chirp signal we are uh, decide to use. Uh, and this is a specially developed uh, chirp signal consists uh, of five tones, uh, 250, 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz. But uh, these tones are um, put together, uh, but with uh, special delays between these uh, tones. So this is a, like a chirp idea, but this delays was actually measured by us. Uh, this is also published that uh, we uh, use this uh, micro uh, this um, uh, technique of uh, ECOG, we uh, uh, we register microphonics, but we uh, assess exactly the delay, uh, which was uh, done because uh, which uh, uh, which is because of the delay of the basal membrane uh, traveling wave, of course, uh, producing a delay. So uh, the low frequency. This uh, you can see the example of the five hundred. Uh, hertz uh, stimulation, uh, and we recorded on electrode actually number three because the position on this electrode was 461. Uh, 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 degree, and this was uh, very close to what we calculated from the Greenwood equation, which is 457. So we measure in the exact anatomic uh, place, and we uh, uh, very precisely measure the delay of 2.75 uh, milliseconds, uh, which we use for this uh, chirp. So we could now uh, use um, the uh, stimulation, this chirp consistent of uh, five uh, tones, uh, and we can trace the response uh, with the system uh, for the particular frequency. The, uh, the red one uh, is uh, 250 hertz. Uh, the yellow one uh, is uh, uh, 500 hertz. Uh, and the rest is 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. But uh, you can see that uh, there is a, 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 a very nice, actually, uh, uh, situation here because uh, we measure only from electrode one and we are measuring continuously. So we can identify some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, surgical events like uh, uh, release of false or, or a high resistance, which produce a, a drop of the amplitude. It's not gone completely, <clears throat> but it's dropping. Uh, and uh, you, you can see that, for example, 200, uh, 20, uh, 250 hertz, the red line recover from this dropping uh, when uh, the surgeon actually met the high resistance. So <clears throat> we really believe that uh, in the future, this can be as alarm. It's not going uh, uh, absolutely to zero, but the amplitude is dropping and we can do something, for example, not push more and we can see the recovery of the response. So uh, we hope that the beauty of this uh, approach is that it could uh, be a helpful during the surgery, but of course also after surgery to analyze the surgical technique. So to conclude, uh, real-time interrupt monitoring with this multiple characteristic frequency, this uh, new chirp, uh, and also video recording. I uh, uh, didn't mention that uh, the software allow us to measure the, uh, uh, to record the surgical video, may allow surgeon and audiologist to continuously assess cochlear function. Uh, and this uh, monitoring tool may prove useful during cochlear implantation surgery to allow frequency specific monitoring of patients hearing status and minimize electrode trauma. So this may be critical for improved hearing out outcomes uh, after cochlear implantation. And this was uh, this first case already published. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Arthur. And we will start our last block of discussion. As I said before, we have Two questions from the previous pre previous block. The first one is really funny, and I know the answers of uh, the four of you. The question says, will surgeons be patient enough to insert electrodes over 30 minutes period? I know uh, the answer of Brandit, Mario, and Arthur, 
uh, it's no, but uh, uh, Bohme, you said yes. Yeah, are you aware of any other surgeon able to insert the electrode over 30 minutes? Uh, to, to be honest, I did it. It's really a burden. I show you now, sometimes I really, I, I can't move my hand anymore or my fingers to hold it. And, and I'm really coming from the surgery every time I swear I will not do it again. <laughs> and, but, but you should not forget it's, it's 30 surgeries in three years. So it's, it's not every day. It's not, it's not it's that seen. bad. And the, the yeah. second question, I'm not sure whether it's related to the topic of our uh, round table, but I mean, if we ask the audience to ask questions, we should just give them even if it's a short answer. Will ABI help better compare to CI in auditory desynchrony neuropathy cases? No. No, it's a, it's a general, it's a general <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay, so we, we've answered both questions. So now we can discuss about uh, your presentation. Arthur, uh, Ranjit, what's your opinion uh, on this uh, record interoperative measurements in CI, in conventional CI, not just for uh, EAS? Ranjit. Yeah. So now, um, I, I would, I mean, the conventional intraop measures is very well discussed in earlier, but I would like to put one important point over here. Is in, in special cases where, for example, you have a complete ossified cochlea where you have to do complete drill out and you have to use a electrode. And most often in these cases, you're not going to get the ECAP measures. So, so in those conditions, you may have to alter intra to measure from your conventional mode. So what we do is we use EAPRs in this case on, on, on these uh, subjects to monitor the, um, uh, the functioning of the spinal ganglion cells over there. So this is uh, one point that I would like to highlight so that it's a case by case, you may have to choose the interoperative measure. In a standard case, perfectly, the ECAP works very well. Some people use um, ESRTs, uh, works very well. But in, in a very uh, uh, radical case, uh, a complicated case where your ECAP is not supporting, uh, in, and then you may have to go for another alternative measures like EABR. So one tool that I always have handy is EABR. Okay. The end, end of the day, Dr. Mohan asked, is the patient hearing or not? That's what I want to know. Great, Ranju. Thank you very much. Mario, you want to say something? Yes, I have a question to add to this presentation. Um, I like this approach with the, the CPL chirp stimulus, very interesting. Also, uh, have you uh, ever checked the processing of the CI processor? Um, what is the, the acoustical signal transferred to the electrical stimulation? Uh, will the, the effect of the chirp stimuli, the compensation of the delay times, Will it be also transferred or is there in the processing maybe a mix of uh, both uh, techniques? What you said to the first question. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, probably a little bit um, uh, not the uh, question uh, about the monitoring because uh, in the monitoring, of course, we are not using the, pro uh, the processor, but uh, we are using the acoustic stimu uh, stimulator, uh, which precisely control the, uh, uh, <coughs> the acoustic waveform we are putting to the ear. So we are using this chirp uh, to enable us uh, to uh, record multi-frequency in the same time and to analyze this uh, for 250 hertz, 500 uh, hertz, uh, 1000, uh, 2000 and 4000 uh, in a continuous way uh, to uh, give this uh, a direct response immediately to surgeon during this insertion. And this insertion can be uh, not so uh, long. It could be even a, a couple of minutes because we are doing this uh, continuously on the first electrode. Uh, but of course, uh, you are right. Uh, that could be an interesting uh, part also to uh, take into the assumption, uh, especially in SSD cases, for example, when we are stimulating uh, electrically one year and we have a delay of wave 
uh, waveforms uh, of a traveling wave in the normal hearing ear. So uh, uh, this is absolutely right. We need also uh, to extend our research on this uh, topic, maybe to uh, have a especially frequency dependent delay in a speech process or strategy to more mimic the properties of acoustic uh, ear, especially when we have a single site uh, implanted patient. Okay, Thank one you. last question, Baumi. Uh, I, uh, too, I want to congratulate you, uh, like Professor Cibula did. This idea with the chirp over the four frequencies is genius. I want to mention, we measure acoustically in two frequencies, in notch noise broadband, 250 and 500. And we have better responses, better outcome in the 500 hertz. So it's easier to measure in the 500 hertz acoustic condition than in 250. And I explained it with a better chance of synchronization in the brain. But to have this chip, it's, it's really, I think, a big step forward. Great. Thank you so much. OK, we are almost on time for this roundtable. Uh, I would like to thank you all, uh, you, the yeah. panelists, for your clear uh, uh, lectures for your clear explanations during the discussion. I would like to thank the audience. And uh, after uh, more than an hour, almost an hour and a half dealing with intraoperative measurements during surgical procedures for hearing implants, there are some ideas that uh, come clear to my mind and may uh, constitute the summary of this, of this round table. As I mentioned before, at La Paz University Hospital in Madrid, we were involved in the first intraoperative measurements for viral sound bridge many, many years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, we learned that for some positions of the implant, especially the wrong window, intraoperative measurements were the key to success. Without this information, you were not able to be successful. Right now we have different methods, uh, as the ones we use uh, at that time, but their need remains exactly the same because the best coupling between the wrong window and the implant can only be found after interoperative assessment of electrical responses. If we move to cochlear implants, uh, interoperative measurements are also extremely important. And this has been shown during this round table and they are useful from a practical standpoint, even though they may not be perfect right now, but to get there, we have to start walking. And both in conventional CIs, as well as uh, during electroacoustic simulation procedures, the feedback obtained by means of intraoperative electrical stimulation gives the surgeon an important feed feedback, improving the hearing results in the short term, and preventing unnecessary early reinterventions. If we know that uh, the hearing in electroacoustic stimulation has been lost, as was mentioned, we can put the electrode all the way down and we uh, don't need to come back later. And finally, with ABI, I know ABI are not as, as popular as middle ear implants or cochlear implants, but with ABI, we have an even more clear need for intraoperative measurements. Unlike cochlear implants, ABIs do not have a fixed place to put the implant. There is no bony structure to accommodate the electrode as uh, happens with cochlear implants. And therefore the ideal position of the electrode must be assessed by means of intraoperative electrical measurements. The use of a test electrode before insertion of the final electrode will depend on the situation as has been uh, clearly stated during the round table, but the need for intraoperative measurements is beyond discussion. Well, we are almost out of time and I just want to thank you again for your attention, participation. And before closing, let me just mention some uh, short practical issues. Uh, you all know what is hearing right now after this round table, you can visit our webpage at www.hearing.com. And there you can find tools like the hearing preservation calculator uh, published by this hearing group, 
the counseling platform or the EIS feeding tool. And the two basic pillars of the hearing group are the quality standards on our educational platform, the hearing boost. The quality standard you can find at hearing.com is a, one of the best tools to get uniform management of patients with hearing disorders. And the Boost Hearing, our educational platform, is our learning management system. You can go there and check how this works. And there you can also find the certification of our courses. At the beginning of uh, this roundtable, Professor Baumgartner mentioned uh, that this roundtable is certified with a CPD accreditation. You can get 1.5 points for the one and a half hours of duration of this roundtable. You just send your request by sending an email to boost at hearing.com. And after some time, I mean, it's not going to be immediate, but after uh, six weeks, uh, you will probably get your uh, certification for this uh, activity, for this teaching activity. Please send us your doubts, questions, or comments to www.hearing.com, and we will be more than pleased to contact you, try to answer your doubts, uh, answer your question, and learn from your personal experience. And here you can also find more information on topics related to hearing. Professor Baumgartner mentioned that this was uh, the 11th round table from the hearing group. And uh, this year is the third, uh, is the third uh, trimester of, of the year. We still have one more for 2022 that will be on December 15. And this one will deal with management of uh, hearing disorders in older adults. We hope, to see, we hope to see you all here on December 15 at the same time to discuss about older adults. Meanwhile, keep safe and please contact us if you need something. Bye.